So we are thrilled to have Jerry Ellsworth on the show with us today. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be on here. Excellent. So I uh, I learned about you actually recently when uh, I, I saw the Kickstarter for Tilt 5 and uh, reached out to you there. And that's kind of how we how we got connected. But uh, let's before we talk about Tilt 5, let's go back. Let's go way back. Why don't you start telling us a bit about yourself uh, and kind of how you got into the industry and the kind of stuff you've been working on? Yeah, I was a super nerdy kid. So um as soon as I was old enough to get into my father's uh, tools and screwdrivers, I started taking apart all of my toys, uh, which uh, was super frustrating for him because I took absolutely everything <laughs> apart in the house. And um, in the early days, um, I didn't necessarily get everything put back together. But um, at a pretty early age, I got into doing electronics. I got the uh, early 8-bit computers, uh, the Commodore 64s and uh, Amiga computers. Got into programming back then. Wrote my own bulletin board system. Oh, wow. Um, you definitely yeah. went further than I did. I, I learned how to program on the VIC-20. to completely, oh. you know, just taught myself how to do it. Uh, but I certainly didn't create a bulletin board system. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. So, um, I was probably like seven or eight years years old when I first got like hooked on uh, wanting to get a computer. Of course, I didn't write a bulletin board system at that time, but um, the VIC-20 and Commodore 64 were both in the store at the time. And I was in love with the VIC-20 because it had bigger characters. You know, the, the yes. letters were bigger than the C64, and I thought that was cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my father made the right choice um, to get me the C64, which had a lot more games on it. So that was uh, very fortunate. Um, yeah, I did all kinds of stuff. Uh, I, I took my computers and my electronics and kind of merged them together as I grew up. I was a phone freaker. Um, I war dialed my entire area code, found all kinds of interesting <laughs> phone numbers. Uh, nice. Of course, I, I wrote my own program to do that. So back then, I wasn't smart enough to turn off the speaker and the modem. So um, all night long, I heard ring, 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 and then people pick up the phone. Hello, hello, hello. Because <laughs> oh. war war dialing is where you just dial every single phone number, you know, right. in the phone book, right. and then you look for other modems. Um, yeah, I had all kinds of fun with the phone system. Uh, made I had my friends convinced I had complete control over the phone systems um, at the, back then. Okay, let me ask um, you this: How fast was your modem? It was 1,200 baud. Wow, well, 1,200. Wow. That's Ooh. blazing fast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, partway, I started with a 300 baud modem, but I never got it to work. Someone gave it to me as a hand-me-down. It was like one of these weird ones you had to take the uh, receiver off and unplug it yeah. and then plug it into the modem. And uh, apparently we didn't have the right uh, phone at the time. I was the same for I me. Should... I had a 300 baud modem for my Commodore 64. Could never get it to work. Yeah, yeah. So I got the 1200 baud modem that was pretty ripping, um, <laughs> and then I got a 2400 baud and got it working on my Commodore 128. That was oh, awesome. Wow. You know, with 80 columns, ANSI graphics. Wow. State <laughs> of the art. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Top of the line stuff. We could talk all day about um, you know phone freaking and BBSs, but maybe I should move on. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I uh, eventually in high school I got into. Um, auto racing which was super cool so my father had raced cars when i was a kid just kind of like these jalopy dirt track cars and i thought that was super cool and i was at the time going through this phase of trying to be wild and crazy i was kind of a goth kid and uh, so i went to the local racetrack and started watching these dirt track races i'm like oh there's nothing more wild than being a race car driver so i tried to convince my father to build me a race car and he's like, absolutely no way am I going to build you a race car. You're going to kill yourself. But I was just like so enamored with it. So I was like bugging and bugging him. And eventually he said, if you figure out a way to either buy a car or build a car, you can do it. But there's no, I'm not doing it for you. And so I just set off to learn how to weld and, and fabricate metal. And I started working with mentors. I worked at a local machine shop, um, our local high school shop and built my first race car. So it was a V8 powered late model car with, um, you know, well, it was like a 383 motor um, back then uh, for the first one, you know, four or 500 horsepower. Um, went out um, to the track for the first time, thought I was gonna break all the, the speed records and uh, ended up coming in the slowest time of the night, the very first time I went out. 
But I eventually got better. I found some mentors to help me. Um, I actually went out to Florida and, and mentored under this really amazing uh, uh, ex-NASCAR racer, uh, Duke Southard. And uh, he taught me all the tricks of racing. And it turns out there's a lot of things that you can do to your car to make the, the car better. But the lessons he taught me was um, it's it, a lot of it's psychology. So if you can get in the heads of your uh, opponents, you have an advantage. So he taught me all these tricks of how to uh, make the uh, competitors think that you're you know one upping them. And wow. so there's yeah yeah. And he's also like if it's not in the rule sheet, um, it's not cheating. So find every way that you can stretch the rules. So. Uh, it was super fun. I did that for five years. I was pretty successful. I ran this big circuit, ended up doing sprint cars, all kinds of stuff, had sponsors, uh, cheated all the time until they passed rules. For instance, I made an electronic traction control system. So um, this was really trick. I, I was super proud of this. So I had a over rev, um, a rev limiter in the car so you don't over rev the motor. And so I found this really clever way through some sensors on the wheels and reading the tachometer that I could... Um, trick the rev limiter into rev limiting the engine if my back tire started spinning too fast. And uh, so I started really dominating when I did that because I could just wow. throw the car into the corner and you just couldn't spin it out. But it had a side effect that also um, taught me a valuable lesson about promoting. Uh, my car would shoot flames out because of all this raw fuel it was dumping in the what? exhaust. <laughs> and I became an instant like uh, fan favorite because my car was shooting all these flames out of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what and the it, monster trucks do right now. Like the ones that shoot the flames, the big, uh, the big uh, dinosaur one that shoots. Them, that's that's the big draw for the kids. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so I found out that if you're a crowd favorite, the flagger will actually give you a little bit more favorable flagging, so you could be a little bit more aggressive on the track because they're about bringing people to the stands and having happy beer drinking, nacho guzzling uh, yeah. fans. And so they love you if you're popular. And so I just amplified that. So, you know, by the time the second or third year, I was starting to get so many trophies that I would just go into the stands and I just give the trophies to the first kid I saw. So then that just amplified the whole thing. Now, how old and were you so, when all this was going on? So um, I think I got my first car built by the time I was 17. And wow. then I ended up dropping out of high school because I started making so much money um, on the racing circuit. <laughs> wow. So I'm a high school dropout. I never went to high school or finished high school or college. So um, who needs it? Who right? needs it? No. You unless, right. unless you're a kid. Right. <laughs> stay in school, kids. kids. Watch it, stay in school. <laughs> no, find, find your right path is what it means. I, it's definitely harder. Um, um, the earlier part of my uh, career was much harder because I would go in for interviews and people would be like, wow, this is amazing. You raced cars and did all this stuff, but... Where'd, where'd you go to school? Right. Oh. <laughs> now, now, the racing cars and the building cars seems like a, a far a far left field from computers. Like, how did you how did you transition from one to the other? Well, um, they're not as far apart as you think because I was doing all these innovations to the cars. It was like pure engineering. Like, I was actually innovating uh, new chassis designs. I built all my cars. Okay. I was putting all this electronics on the cars. But... It's a hard business to be in. So I did that about five years. And then um, I went to visit one of my friends that I went to high school with. We were sitting around in his like uh, man cave in the garage. And he showed me this uh, 486 PC that he'd built. And he had tricked a wholesaler of electronic, uh, the components, to sell him stuff wholesale. And so he's like, yeah, this computer, I built it for, I don't know, it was like $600. But normally it sells for like twelve to $1,500. And my entrepreneurial side kicked in. I'm like, holy cow, that's right? yes, <laughs> that's a lot here. of profit. Like, yeah. it's a lot, a lot easier than scarring my hands at welding, uh, you know, tube chassis together. And so I'm like, hey, you know, it's 1995. Um, everyone's wanting to get on the internet. Like, I'll fund this whole thing. I'm going to get out of racing. I'll just sell all my stuff off and let's open a computer store. And that's uh, what I ended up doing. Is we opened this computer store. And of course, remember, I'm still like super gothy back then. And I'm like swearing like a sailor because I'm hanging out at the racetrack <laughs> on the weekends. So I'm not exactly relatable when it comes to uh, customers. So we start this computer store and immediately me and my business partner just start banging heads. Oh, just like, nice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was I had a lot of growing to do. And uh, 
uh, he ended up like booting me out of the business. I ended up like going flat broke on the whole thing, but I got pissed off, which is kind of my MO through my whole career. Someone pisses me off and then it's like, you know, all hell breaks loose. Um, So I went down the street. I like scraped up a little bit more money, actually moved out of my apartment that I was in and took my uh, deposit, rented this little, it was a one seat barber shop that had gone out of business. And I like unbolted the barber chair and shoved it into the alley out back and uh, started a computer store down the street from him just to drive him out of business, just pure revenge. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Wow, that's awesome. (laughs) And so um, I didn't have any money for product back then, so I would just go to his dumpster and, like, pull all the little (laughs) colorful boxes out of his dumpster. (laughs) And so... Like on the store shelves, there were like all of these boxes, but they were all empty. So customers would come in like, oh, yeah, I want that Sound Blaster sound car. And be like, no problem. That one's reserved. So if you give me the money, I'll have it here in like two or three days. And so, you know, for the first half a year, I was doing this Rob Peter to pay Paul just right. to uh, to bootstrap the company. Still gothy, still like not relatable at all. Um, That's still pretty actually ingenious, the- though. Of living in the back of this computer store, eating uh, ramen noodles um, ten times a week. Um, I had some funny stories along the way. I, I still like kind of can't believe this happened. Like, of course, I couldn't pay for garbage service, so I was like dumping my garbage into everyone's dumpsters throughout the neighborhood. And one day, I was in like working with a customer, and the police came in. Like, we know this is you. We're gonna like find you and. It was super embarrassing. (laughs) All kinds of like shenanigans like that happen. But um, fortunately, I had another mentor that came into my life at that point. Across the street from my business was an insurance salesman, and he took like a liking to me. He's like, he'd come over, he'd bring me food at lunch, and uh, he would like start teaching me about running a business. And he's like, there's this thing called relatability. And, you know, swearing in front of your customers and having, like, super dark, like, eyeliner on. And (laughs) it's not exactly uh, relatable. And so um, he was super successful. And so I slowly, I can't say the word, um, slowly uh, started uh, uh, taking his advice. And sure enough, things turned around and the store started really taking off. I drove my ex-business partner out of business. and uh, Well, who thought um, being nice to customers would help, right? I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's funny. You wanna, I think to be successful in business, you have to have a little bit of an edge, but you also have to know how, when to dial that back. That's true. And, yeah. And so over the last, you know, 20, 25 years or so, I've learned that the right balance of when to smash your fist on the table and throw a temper tantrum in the right time to, like, <sighs> eat your anger, just... <laughs> Let it but yeah, go. the car business like took off. Uh, it was a, a an explosive time for um, computer stores. Like at one point, we were selling so many computers and selling so many components out of this little shop that um, it would come in on pallets, and people would be lined up outside. And I'd have my employees like standing guard on the pallets as we broke it down. And I had a list of like, oh, here's your component. You're paid. Here go. And it was wow, really. Nice. Really fun, and so I uh, expanded the business into five stores. It was like super popular. In uh, 2000, though, um, there was like this huge uptick. Like it was just like we are just skyrocketing. Year 2000s coming. Everyone's upgrading because their computers are going to just explode. Of course, on- yes. Y2K. Yeah. 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 Everyone thought everything was going to break in Y2K, so it was great for business and. Uh, all of a sudden, after year 2000, Y2K, like, business dropped to, like, zero overnight. Like, completely saturated our market. And, like, we started hemorrhaging money like crazy. Um, and it was really sad because, like, um, all of my employees and all of us, we were just all these young punk kids that just loved working on computers. And we were really family. We just hung out all the time. We would come do network gaming on the weekends. and uh, But then all of a sudden, we're losing money, and uh, people are having to be laid off. And by 2001, um, I just gave the stores away to the employees. I'm like, you know, if you guys want them, 
you know, take them. I'm going to go do something else. And if you can pay me back someday, that's great. So uh, all the stores failed except for one. And one of them is still going today. I actually was up in Oregon and I drove past the store and it's still there. Really? So one of, nice. One of them nice. kept it going. Like that, <clears throat> they have um, an iron constitution. I just don't know how they pulled it off. I mean, computer store business is not an easy thing. And it never got easy after right, that. Right. After well, actually, it's funny because you mentioned you started your you started building computers in '95, and in 1995, I was working at a computer store building and selling computers. Oh, really? Yeah, I was in school. I was uh, learning to become a programmer at the time, <laughs> and that's what I did for work was building and selling computers. So it was just funny that you were doing the same thing at the same time. And that store actually that I worked at is still around to this day. Yes, yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I think it's neat. I mean, back then, you know, we actually started our computer store. Windows 95 wasn't out. We didn't even have an inkling that Windows 95 was going to come out. And Windows 95 hit about the same time we were schooling up. And it was such an explosive hit. Yeah. You know, just integration with Internet Explorer and Netscape um, allowed people to get on the Internet. AOL was just super hot. and But computers back then were super janky right? Oh, yes. So there weren't many people that could keep these things going. So we didn't charge a lot to um, work on the computers, but it was just constantly, people just constantly had to bring their computers into us. So it was just this reoccurring revenue on every computer that we sold. <clears throat> it was a fantastic time. So um, during that same time, um, I'd always been doing electronics and computer things um, more on the low level close to the metal side and so I got into doing these things called FPGAs which are these really cool chips that can emulate um, custom chips and so because I had this extra money I could buy all these tools which was really fortunate I was just doing this as a hobby and so for years I'd been doing this and I built all of these little circuit boards that did things like you could, uh, I could display video, I could hook joysticks up to these boards and I could do simple um, sound generation and things like that. So after the computer stores imploded, I'm like, well, I could either go back to school or I can like just go do some other big bold thing and my, my uh, MO is just like go out and just be brave and do it. And so I decided to start going to Silicon Valley and meeting these entrepreneurs that are um, creating consumer products and, and doing startups. So I started going to Silicon Valley, meeting all these entrepreneurs and showing them all my little circuit boards that I built and like, hey, I want to be a chip designer. And uh, uh, I ended up going flat broke again, uh -huh. you know, trying to bootstrap my uh, engineering career because I would go in for these interviews and it would usually end the same way. I'd get in like one or two uh, interview sessions and then HR would come in and be like where'd you go to school yeah exactly that's I mean I don't know how many times that the interview was cut off like short probably because when I was interviewing with other folks they'd be like so where'd you go to school and I'd be like I didn't I'm self-taught and then they go tell HR and then HR would come like end the interview early and but I had this one really um, amazing first break that um, really kind of kick-started my career. And that was, I met this founder of this company and he's like, you seem like the really scrappy type that we're into. Come back. I was living in Portland at the time. And he's like, come, come down to Silicon Valley and interview with the team. I go, I start the interview partway through, they cut off the interview and I'm walking out of the building and I, I meet the uh, founder going down the stairs and he's like, Hey, where are you going? I'm like, well, the, they cut off the uh, interview. And he's like, what? And he's like, have you met much of the team yet? I'm like, no, I met like one person. And uh, he's like, come with me. And he just like took me up to their conference room. And he just like brought in the whole team. And he's like, all right, I'm going to lead this interview. And you guys listen. And he just like rapid fire asked me all these questions. And I'm like, well, I do this, I do that. And he's like, we're going to hire you. And... Uh, I took that very serious when he hired me. I just worked my ass off and made sure I delivered a really good um, design to him. And so from that job, I was able to springboard and I got this reputation over time as like the ace that you call if you need something done and like 
record time. It's like I just will work 24-7, make sure it happens. Um, toot my own horn, I'm sorry. But <laughs> <laughs> I just did one of those a couple mo- uh, a couple years ago, I'll have to tell you about. Um, so, um, yeah, I got this reputation. And then in 2004, uh, a toy company contacted me. They saw some of the stuff that I was doing online around retro computers. And they're like, we're designing this toy. We want to take the Commodore 64 and stick it in a joystick and uh, put a bunch of video games in it. And so you just slap some batteries in the bottom of this thing and plug it into your TV. Um, Can you design a custom chip for us to do this? And I'm like, I'd never done a full custom chip up to that point. I'm like, yeah, no problem. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) They're like, okay, put a team together to do this. And so, you know, I just boldly went towards this uh, this task. I, I grabbed a couple people that knew how to program the Commodore 64, and I did all of the chip design and in kind of record time, like eight months, I think is what it took us. I designed this chip that was the entire Commodore 64 in in a single chip wow. for this toy. Two people, two or three people worked on the software side of it, took all these uh, retro games and modified them so they would run inside this joystick and have a menu system. And uh, I I didn't realize what was going to happen with this project. Um, I'd never heard of viral marketing before. Um, But something kind of accidental happened. So the, the group of us that were working on this project were all Commodore 64 fans, and we had a lot of love for this computer. So the programmers put extras in for the soft, on the fo- software side. They had all these yeah. extra games in it. They actually put a game in where you jump off of a cliff, and you like do this back dive, and you try to land your head right on the rocks below of this cliff. <laughs> <laughs> the better you can kill yourself, the oh higher you're... <laughs> Um, and then they put pictures, like embedded pictures of like all of us drinking beers with these famous uh, programmers and stuff. And, and so I was at the factory um, and there's all kinds of shenanigans that happened around the factory too. Like the, the toy factory tried to cost reduce the design. It almost didn't work. I almost lost the, the company like millions of dollars, um, but we turned it around. But I was at the toy factory and I drop into the secret menu and one of the toy execs were there, was there when I was doing this, or the toy personnel. And he's, he's like, what is that? Like, oh, we added a couple things. Um, it's just a little secret menu. And he's like, what? <laughs> Tell me exactly what you put in there. And it, apparently it was not a good thing because Uh-oh. they have, <laughs> you know, the toy's rated for a certain age, right? And so... Um, it put them at risk of not meeting their age requirement on the toy and lots of bad, bad um, things could happen. He's like, you cannot talk about this, you know, and you're in so much trouble. You're never going to work with us again. It was just like all these threats. <laughs> like, okay, well, okay, you didn't have whatever. to take it out though. I was too late. So back then yeah. uh, oh. we're using these, <clears throat> these things called mask roms. Mm-hmm. So you burn them once. And we had made 250,000 of these mask roms with the games in it. So, and <laughs> we're in the middle of production. Like these things are coming off the production line and going into um, containers to, to be shipped all over the world. Uh, well, not all over the world. They actually went to one place, which is another interesting part of the story. <laughs> you can tell me to speed up if this is too boring and it's stuff. It's all good. But, it's all good. Oh, this is really interesting. Um. So, yeah, we're, like, deep in production. There's no going back from this thing. And so they forbid me from, you know, like, even uttering a word about this. And so I got back home, and the guy I was dating at the time, and I was talking to him, like, well, fuck it, you know. <laughs> I'm never working with them again. And he's like, I'm going to make a fake blog, and we're going to just, like, release the information. So he made this fake blog, which was supposedly one of the Chinese workers at the factory that was into toy hacking. And so he made all these like fake back posted uh, blog posts about like hacking toys. And he's, oh, no. <laughs> and the blog post, the, the last blog post was like, hey, I'm working on this fantastic toy. It's got all of these really neat Easter eggs in it. Plus, you can, you can open it up and solder wires inside of it and, and hook up connectors so you can download your own games into it and hook a keyboard up to it. And so. Um, a few days before this thing launched, and it launched on QVC, which is a home shopping network, yep. which is a very 
odd place to, to launch a toy, um, or I thought at the time. Um, this thing goes live, it hits Slashdot, which was super popular at the time, and then all of a sudden this viral thing happened, like it hit this like fever pitch where um, people around the world are like, this is so amazing, I've got to get it, i got to get it. So this thing goes live on QVC. I'm getting these letters from, or these calls from the toy executives saying they're going to sue me for this. <laughs> like, oh, oh shit, no. I really, really put my foot in this. Oh man. And uh, first day, I think they sold like seven, seven, uh, 75K of these things in the first 24 hours. And um, it turns out, on QVC, there's like this number that's scrolling by, like how many units are sold. Yes, that number yeah. is real. And I was actually on the CC of the emails that would come in once an hour for um, sales. And I'm watching these numbers go up and up and up and up. And I'm like, holy cow, these things are selling so fast. And QVC is sending letters to um, the toy company. Like, they're like, we don't know what's going on. Like, we're only offering this domestically, but over 50% of these are going worldwide. Like, what's going on? And uh, all of a sudden, the toy guys like com did a complete turnaround. They're like, you're the best. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to sue you anymore. And I ended up going and doing uh, like five or six other toys with them. And um, I just promised that I would inform them if there was going to be any extras going in. And they actually embraced it. So a lot of the toys I did with them had all these neat little Easter eggs in it. Really? Yeah, yeah. They it went was, from uh, wanting to sue you over it to saying, do more. Well, it's kind of funny is they didn't understand like the concept of Easter eggs. Sure. So I did a re-release of this product, which um, actually I think they sold close to a million of these things. Um, but they put in the instruction manual how to drop into these secret menus. And I'm like, you guys don't get like an Easter egg. How Easter eggs work? Yeah. You gotta, you gotta I, find it on some chat board somewhere, you know, and, and just find it somehow. You don't, you don't put it in there, or by accident. Have, we did have to tone down some of the content. So, like the first two hundred fifty thousand of these things had different content in the secret menus than the second ones, but we still kept it pretty edgy. I think the cliff diving is what it was called in the menu remained in there. But if you actually uh, looked at it you're like killing your poor little guy he does this little death twitch at the end <laughs> with <his feet. laughs> that's awesome uh, that was super fun but that launched my career um new york times which um back then they were like i mean this is 2004 um it was a weird time i, I look back at this like google was actually a pretty new thing at the time the new york times ran this really beautiful article like they called it a toy with a story, and they covered, like, here's this crazy high school dropout that built race cars and owned computer stores and, like, taught herself how to uh, design chips, and now here's this runaway success toy, which even drew, drove more sales of the product. Um, that put me on the, kind of, in people's eyes in, on the Internet, which was very weird for me. Um, actually, um, one of my friends discovered that I beat... Um, it was around December or something. Like I beat Santa on Google searches. Really? Oh wow! Wow! So take that, Santa. <laughs> <laughs> More popular than Santa. That's great. So that was kind of fun, and uh, but then from there that that really jump started my career. I did tons of toys. I did tons of chip designs. I did all kinds of things that were super high end. I made this video compression I see with this company that um, ended up in the TiVo, which was super cool and uh, worked in old company, uh, an old company, but was still very relevant today called New Tech, which was kind of a really cool um, opportunity for me. They made the thing called the video toaster. It's like, yes. wow, I would have never thought I would have worked for the company that video toaster. Um, and then fast forward to something a little bit more relevant. Um, a company called Valve Software, they have a big platform called Steam. And I, if think, you I think I've heard of them. Yeah. I think I've heard of them. <laughs> they, may, twice. they may have $10,000 or more of your money uh, right. from PC <laughs> games. Um, so they, they started uh, pretty much stalking me, which was, um, it was interesting. Like, they approached me. They're like, hey, we're from Valve. 
and we want you to work with us and we want you to run our hardware department. And I had installed Steam and played some games before, but I hadn't really placed the name Valve and Steam together because I just logged in enough to play the, the PC games that I wanted. And yeah. um, so it's like this stupid named company called Valve. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, in this part of my career, I hadn't been doing much PC gaming at that point. I mean, I was, um, you know, my PC gaming kind of ended at uh, Counter-Strike, you know, back in the computer store days. And I'd, occasionally would do a, a PC game. I was more of a console player at this time. And uh, so a stupid company called Valve contacted me all the time through all kinds of different channels. They were like reaching out to me on various social media. And I'm a pinball collector. I have, um, now I have about 80 pinball machines. Wow. Kind of oh, nice. Yeah. And uh, so I go to all these different events where the collectors go and the players go. And uh, here's these Valve people like, walking up to me <laughs> like i'm playing a pinball machine and they're at the pinball machine next to me like hey you're jerry right <laughs> hey we're from <laughs> i'm not kidding that's that's crazy that's, they're like you, sh you should come by we're, we're we're a big deal and uh they're like nah 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 and so i'm still living in portland at the time and so gabe newell the founder of the company flies down to meet with me well they and... really wanted you yeah wow. yeah <laughs> And at this time, um, when I started, sorry, I'm, I'm way all, all over the place. So when I worked at New Tech, that was just prior to this, um, video streaming was what they were just getting into, and it was a really new thing. Um, so, you know, pretty much everything I get into, I'm like, well, I need to understand it. So at that time, I had my workshop, so I took their um, TriCaster, which was the device I was working on, and I was testing it right in my um, hardware lab, my workshop. So I just set up all these cameras in my workshop and uh, just live streamed me working on stuff 24-7. That was pretty surreal to do. And uh, had people just logging in, and we had this voice chat thing where people could chat to me and they could move cameras around. and. Um, <laughs> super fun but they had discovered a bunch of my youtube videos that i'd done kind of around this because i do these kind of hardcore science educational videos on my youtube channel and they're like we saw a bunch of your user experience and kind of cutting edge stuff that you're experimenting with, with you know you're the perfect person to come in and help us make games more fun so that was why they were so excited about having me come up and and do that and my manufacturing background as well. So Gabe Newell comes down, takes me out to lunch, and I'm still really reluctant. I'm like, okay, yeah, you guys are a big company, but you're a software company. I just don't know, you know, I just, I've been around software companies that want to do this kind of stuff. They usually don't have the commitment. And he's like, just, just come up for an afternoon and we'll just take you around the office. It's not an interview. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's fine. So I get there. They stick me in a room with like 10 people and it's an interview. Oh and <laughs> but Gabe's in there kind of hosting the same thing. It's very deja vu of my very my break that I got. And they're just like rapid firing stuff like, you're going to make a joystick. How do you do it? I'm like, oh, I go to Tainam, this manufacturer in China. We just do it that way. And just like piece of cake. You know, you're like, you're going to do a set top box. I'm like, well, I just like hire this person and do that. And I don't know, after an hour or two, they like, like everyone got up and left and then Gabe just like say like, follow me <laughs> he's, he's kind of a gruff guy it's really fun I like Gabe a lot <laughs> <laughs> but you never I mean, like, did you ever tell him it was a stupid name for a company though uh, maybe <laughs> they, did, <laughs> they did fire me later so <laughs> maybe that had <laughs> um so uh, uh they took me to the fourth floor of the 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 building like this whole floor is yours you have an unlimited budget just bring all your cohorts in here and you just just make it work go off think about um, how we're gonna do this because at the time Microsoft um, had been edging in on their business and that um, Windows Metro uh, interface was coming out and they were threatening to not allow Steam to sell games on the Metro uh, user interface. They wanted you to only go through the Microsoft Store. And so that was a big threat to them. Worst it's, interface ever. Yeah. The turned out not to be much of a threat to the uh, 
help. But um, at the time, it was a real threat to them. So they like they needed this contingency plan. And so Gabe gave me this um, directive. He's like, this is your goal. Put a team together. I want you to take the whole family, bring them together, everyone from grandma to grandpa to the grandkids, and have them all playing games on Steam, of course, in the living room. I was like, well, that sounds pretty cool because I'm all about making products that bring people together and all about fun. So how could I resist? And so I went up and thought about it for a week or so, and I came back to him. And I said, okay, here's my thesis. This is what I'm going to do. I want one-third prototypers, people that can build stuff really fast. I want one-third people that can um, do product kind of like myself. Then I want one-third researchers and just bring this dream team together. And we're going to do a bunch of fundamental research at first. And then we're going to divide out and we're going to start building products. And he's like, great, go. And so that's what we did. It was really magical. So we spent, I can't remember what year I started there, but um, we spent a year and a half or two just doing fundamental research. And this was really fortunate for me because through pure brute force, we were um, experiencing things that people are not going to see for decades. So we were doing augmented reality, we were doing virtual reality, we were reading people's minds with electrodes and wow. through violation, um, just throwing money at it just so we could experience. We had these things, we called them the head crab, which is based off of you know their earlier games, which was like the AR, yeah. VR setups. They were giant, but they were super high performance and were like, oh, wow, this is what augmented reality is going to be like someday. I mean, we took Dota, one of their games, and we put it on the table so you could look at it god mode. Oh, it's my like, gosh. Oh. You know, it's like this is the way people are going to do eSports in the future because you can just watch the whole thing and unfold in front of you. Um, we're doing virtual reality. We did um, one of my favorite things is like we took um, – uh, left for dead and we took over the director in it which was the thing that spawns all the zombies and right. brings out all the health packs yeah. and all this stuff to play the game and we just put that on the table so that uh, people could take a wand and they could drop zombies or they could drop health packs and so you could sit on the couch with your friends and on your coffee table your buddy could be sitting there dropping zombies in on you and uh, health packs and there's like these really like intense and fun uh, social dynamics that just like emerge out of that that just heighten the game like of course the first thing you do is you take and you drop a thousand zombies in around the corner and you kill your friend yeah. Yeah. right your friend reaches over and punches you in the arm and you're like okay I'll be nicer to you next time and so they go through and you drop just enough zombies to bring them to one health bar and then you start dropping health packs right to help them out but then there's all these like moments of delight that happen like you're dropping health packs but they're running right past them you're like dude i'm dropping health packs for you get it pick it up get it like up. get away from zombies go yeah. go go and then it's just like a social um game where it's just super frantic and super fun and it's just like takes it to the next level but we were experiencing those things um there and it was pure purely it was just so joyous and so then we start dividing into like groups to um create products. There was a group working on VR, I was working on AR, there was a set-top box group, there was a group doing uh, the Steam controller, which there were all kinds of variants of that, which were really cool and never got released. Um, and uh, I got super hooked on AR. I'm like, okay, this is the computing platform of the future, but it's also the gaming platform of the future, because it takes... And this is a lot of the thesis around Tilt 5. So now we're starting to get into Tilt 5. Um, it takes the things that you love about video games and the things you love about board games, and it merges them together. And it's a continuum. So you've got both sides. So in AR, you can go really heavy on cardboard and uh, plastic meeples and stuff like that and have very little um, computer-generated um, things added to it, just a few things. Or you can go really hard the opposite direction and you can make it very video game-like and have a lot of video game elements and very few of the um, the plastic and cardboard components and anywhere in between. And so you get the benefits of, you know, 
for video games, you get head to head, you get group play, you have everyone sitting around, you get to look people in the eyes when you like blow up their village or your uh, military men run in and, and attack them, which you don't get with regular video games. On the board game side, you get things like you get to play with people over the internet. So when I take my you know, plastic dragon and I put it on the table and I'm connected to my friend's game board across the world, they see an avatar of that plastic dragon show up at the other side. So then, you know, that breaks down all these barriers. You don't necessarily have to be in the same room to enjoy a board game. So right. you can just like get into a board game instantly. So was all um, this, all, all of this development, was this still happening at Valve as well? Definitely saw like the, the hints of it, right? Okay. Um, a lot of times when your, you, your work at Valve went into AR cast, did it not? It did. Yeah. It did. So um, Valve's a funny place. Uh, they like have these like uh, identity, I guess, like these identity crises. Like they're, there's no managers in the company. There's It's just all self-organized, like all the employees um, lobby for what the company should be doing. And there was like this huge push, like we're, the company just like, we're doing virtual reality. AR is not a thing. Okay. And our group is like, no, no, no. Like virtual reality has too much friction. It's really fun. But like our goal is to like bring the whole family together. AR is the solution. And then, you know, times have changed too. The threat of um, Microsoft had subsided. The urgency wasn't there to like do like this the, the um, original mission and so they just purged the entire ar group including myself oh, okay. which was oh. which was heartbreaking mm. i mean i actually i went to uh, gabe's office and he he fired me himself and that's like one of the rules they have around there like if you hire someone you, you have to fire them okay and and so i got the notification that was like the weirdest like layoff i've ever been in um where we kind of knew for like six hours in advance who was getting laid off so it was like this like walking <laughs> walk you know, dead, like i i've been through the exact same thing with blackberry we, really? yeah oh yeah we got an email at nine o'clock the night before that there was a meeting first thing in the morning about structural changes and we're <laughs> like okay I, I mean you know there's only seven of us on the email it didn't go to the whole team we all know what this means <laughs> yeah oh i have stories yeah yeah <laughs> oh I've done some, uh, even in at Cast AR, my, my startup, we botched a few things like that. And it was really stupid. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it was surreal. I mean, now I can laugh about it because like things are like really, you know, great for us. But at the time it was like, wow, we'd seen what the future was going to be. And now it's getting, we're getting cut off at our knees. But you and didn't so want to, you didn't want to let it go. No, no. So I knew probably six hours in advance that I was going to get laid off. Everyone in the company is coming by the AR lab, like, you know, like lamenting that they were shutting us down. It's like, I mean, it's really sad when you have people in the company coming, like saying like, this was our favorite part of the hardware lab. I can't believe it. And you're having to sit there listening to this for hours. So then I go to Gabe's office during my assigned time to get axed. And so I'm like, I worked up like what I was going to do. I'm going to like go in. I'm going to chew him out. <laughs> it was like I packed up everything, moved to Seattle, like put my whole life, you know, into this. So I walk in the door and I, I start off a little aggressive and like wagging my finger or something. And then uh, partway through, I'm crying. Uh, <laughs> later, I'm like, you should just sell this to me, Ooh, whatever. And he's like, okay, it's yours. And so $100, well, it took a lot of legal work, but $100 and a handshake later, um, I took this technology out, which is the DNA that's behind what we're doing here. Wow. And I, I started a company with a couple folks from Valve um, called Cast AR. Super early. Oh, my gosh. Like, VR wasn't even hardly a thing at the time. Oculus had just barely done a Kickstarter and they were still making people vomit um, with their old headset. <laughs> and uh, so, Cast AR itself was not actually Valve then. This was after you left Valve. It became Cast AR. Is that yeah? Some of the okay. some of the tech techniques were developed at at Valve. So there's a really clever optical system that I discovered at Valve, which is 
instead of trying to put a bunch of screens and lenses really close to your eyes, which is a really tough thing to do, you and there's all these downsides to doing that. Um, in particular for AR, that's why all of these AR headsets like HoloLens Magic Leap and have really tiny images that are um, fixed focus and you kind of hurt your brain if you try to like bring objects too close to your face. And But we... We, I had discovered a pure accident. I was working on one of these near-eye optic systems, and I had installed a component backwards. So instead of projecting the light into my eye, it was projecting the light out into the room. And one of my colleagues was doing laser bounce experiments with this material called retroreflector. And it's really cool material that when light hits this film, and it's as thin as paper, and this um film takes the light and turns it around 180 degrees and sends it right back to where it's coming from. Wow. So when I when I looked into this optical system, like 30 feet across the room, I saw this beautiful image on this little tile of retro reflector. And I'm like, what is this? What's going on? Why am I seeing like this really beautiful image over there? And uh, so weeks went by and I just kept thinking about like, wow, this is interesting. And then I started like kind of crunching numbers, like how cheaply can I make a system and how wide of a field of view can I make? And does it solve some of these problems? Like, oh, yes, it does. It solves like these focus problems. It, you can get really close to virtual objects and they're in focus. Um, it's like a fraction of the cost to do a, a headset with this. I'm like, this is the way to make a, an AR headset until someone breaks all of these laws of physics uh, so we can do it another way. Yeah, and so, you know, even seven years ago or so when I was at Valve, I was like, this is the way to do a, a headset. It requires a game board. Right. Hence, game boards are the natural first step for us with this yeah. technology. Um, so I started this company, and everything looked really well. I mean, there was a lot of VR hype. Um, we did a Kickstarter, raised a million dollars on the Kickstarter. It was um, pretty good. Um and but we really didn't have an identity back then like we were just kind of riding the hype train we hadn't like figured everything out yet um but moved the company to silicon valley from washington and then got uh, wrapped up with a bunch of uh, uh sand hill road investors which um in uh, silicon valley there's kind of this way you run a startup which is like go big and fluff it up really big and so as uh, Along the way, I'd made a couple mistakes. So as we were moving to Silicon Valley, I hired a CEO to take over you know, my position as the CEO because I was feeling insecure about running a venture-backed company. And I actually got along really well, and we worked really well with the CEO. But he was so new to the company, once we took the Sand Hill Road money, they're like, ah, oh, you need to upgrade your CEO. And they just like pushed him out, and they brought in a bunch of uh, Disney executives that oh. proceeded to burn all the money and crash the company into oh, the ground. No. Um, night so it was really really sad another heartbreaking moment and our our whole team was like heartbroken and but the core team and we'd actually developed our first product and we shipped units out and people were loving it so uh, we're like we got to buy this so we bought the technology and we're like all right we're doing it different this time and so part of the deal with my co-founders was they're like all right jerry You've always held the vision for the company. Never let go of the CEO position. Like, we're not doing this unless you remain CEO. And so that's it. I'm staying CEO. I'm driving the vision of the company. And I'm not going to fuck it up this time by um, handing it over to a bunch of uh, uh, Sand Hill Road folks. And uh, and so th that that's when Tilt 5 was born. That, yep. Yep. Um, so I've actually bought the company twice, which is, I don't, <laughs> I don't plan on doing that again. Uh, I'm super proud. So anyone that participated in our Kickstarter before, um, many of the people got the headsets. Um, but when the, the investors got involved, they wanted, they're just like, screw those people. Like, just quit working on that product. We have a different direction for you. I insisted on making sure that we gave a refund to everyone and... So, I that's just the way I am. I just don't want to like uh, and that's, screw people like that. That's great because like Kickstarter, that's that's the risk of Kickstarter is that a lot of people you you put money down on stuff and you'll never maybe never see that product or your money back. So yeah, the we fact were the that first. You took care of those people. That's great. 
we're the first company to ever do that. Like most, <laughs> most of these companies will just, you know, run off with the money or not deliver the product and do something else. And I insisted on that. So it's just, That's you know, awesome. So I, why don't I we, try to, sorry, finish your thought. I don't know. I lost it. Okay, Go ahead. Sorry. So why don't we dive into tilt five completely now and, and tell us like, what is the, the, what is the tilt five hardware? How does it work? What, what do you see in the future and what, what are you looking to do right now? Oh, great. Great. Yeah. So tilt five has gone through um, multiple iterations to get to this point and it's taken a quite a bit of time. When, when I first started this um, working in AR, there was barely enough technology to make any of this stuff work. And in recent years, we've been able to shrink the size of the headset down to something that's super lightweight. And wow. it's just featherweight. Yeah. It's uh, 85 grams. <laughs> you can just uh, slip the glasses on and you can wear them all day. I mean, they're, they're still kind of dork glasses. But, <laughs> <laughs> but they're comfortable dork glasses. They're, they're comfortable. Um, we, we've been able to, um, through some clever techniques in the headset, we've been able to make it so you can run this on cell phones which is really important. So inside the headset, there's this chip that's doing this thing called reprojection, it means that we can run multiple headsets off of a single computer, like a PC, or we can run one off of an Android um, cell phone, you know, future um, operating systems for cell phones in the future. Um, we've expanded the field of view in our glasses so that it absolutely just fills the entire table with graphics, and that's really important for a tabletop experience. Wow. And our optical system is in focus through the entire range that you would use it for tabletop games. So you can bring, you can stick your nose right into the game board and be like three or four inches away from the virtual objects and they're in focus. And if you're um, like a couple meters away, like six feet or so, um, it's still in focus. And then the, the system also has these really cool attributes for focus as well. So when you use our wand, which is a, it's six degrees of freedom lets you kind of carve through 3D space and point and click on things. But you can actually have objects right at the tip of the wand. And you can focus on the wand and on the virtual objects at the same time, which is super unique. Um, no other AR system allows you to have in focus um, like that, where you can look at the real world objects and the, the virtual objects. And another example is if you take your, um, your mini, like this dragon, you want it to shoot virtual flames, you can actually focus on the virtual flames and you can focus on the, the mini as well. So we've done a lot of innovations in the optics. And then uh, the cost of the system, we've been able to get it down to $299 um, for the base kit, which is pretty phenomenal con considering like systems that can't even do this kind of up close stuff are still $2,500 to $3,500. Yeah. 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 And so, um, we're, we're doing our Kickstarter now, and we have a couple different tiers that um, people can participate in. We have our base kit, which is two ninety nine. We have one that's a little bit more deluxe, which has a bigger game board, like a, a more of a and d centric board game that you can do some really cool stuff with. And then we have a group pack, which has the big game board and, and three headsets for a little bit cheaper price um, per headset. Now, the, um, the game board itself... Uh... Like you only see the objects on the game board. Is that how it works? Correct. Okay. Correct. And that's the trade off that we made. So we had two choices when we were doing this product. So we could just go down the same path as the folks that are doing um, the super expensive headsets. And then our headset would be super expensive and no one could afford it. Or we can make these compromises to make it work really well, well for tabletop experiences. And as I mentioned earlier, when we were chatting, like, Having launched uh, Cast AR, we learned a lot of lessons along the way. And one of those lessons we learned was do one thing really, really well and then expand from there. You know, when we took the venture capital money, they wanted us to go in every different direction and you lose your, your focus. So we focused on tabletop games for our first experiences. So, you know. Like I said earlier, everything you love about uh, video games and everything you love about board games blended together, and then you can um, choose, you know, either as a game developer or as a player, like where in that spectrum you want to be. Do you want to be mostly cardboard and plastic pieces and only have a little bit of augmentation to it, or um, do you want to be completely virtual and you just have absolutely everything virtual in it? Right. 
and it's been a learning experience. So I, I've been at this for like five years um, building this product and my team has, like we've been together for a very long time. And so kind of funny story around this, like very early on, I'm like, hey, this will be great for like Warhammer. And I've oh, never played yeah. Warhammer before. Yeah. So yeah, I played a lot of tabletop <laughs> games before, but not Warhammer. So I go to one of the local meetups for Warhammer and I go prancing in there and I'm like, guys, I got the thing for you. You know, forget about all your little miniatures that you're painting up. You can just, we'll just virtualize all those, and it'll be so great. And like, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I got. Well, that's yeah. because they they pride themselves on their miniatures. That's yeah. what the whole yeah. Warhammer and Lord of the Rings Warhammer. I have a friend of mine who does Lord of the Rings Warhammer. It's yeah. all about the paint jobs because mm -hmm. they get awards for the best painted army. Right. So it's like you want to take away their pride and joy and they're not going to have anything to do with it. But when you you mentioned Warhammer there, all I could think of was a game like Gloomhaven. What an amazing game that would be in AR on uh, on, I, on Tilt 5. Like because that I game got Gloomhaven has, over here on the shelf and I, I, it's yeah. so complicated. I haven't got time to sit down and figure it out. And that's just it. There are so many pieces and so many so much involved in actually setting up the game just to play it that if it was virtual on the table like that, it would be amazing. Right? Oh, and and I, like if you don't want fully virtual, then having like rule assistance and um, difficulty level leveling between players, that's super exciting for me. Like right. one of my frustrations is my friends, let's just use Gloomhaven for an example. So Gloomhaven, they get it and they play it for like three months before I get a chance to go over and play with them. They know all the rules. I walk in, I'm at a deficit because they know all the rules. But now we could put on our glasses and we don't have to have a ton of augmentation on the actual uh, Gloomhaven board game itself. We could just play it on our, our mat and you put the pieces down, but then I have hints. Like it's just detecting the pieces and it's like, well, maybe you should consider doing this right. or that. And because each one of our headsets, you get a private display. Um, people around you don't necessarily um, have to be in the know about what you're, you, what what's happening. Like so, um, the tactics that the computer is telling you to do won't be revealed to them, so it won't be giving away the uh, y your next move. Right. And that's another kind of cool part of our system, actually. Before I go on to like the uh, fog of war, I want to go back to the Warhammer and sure. like resolve, finish off that story That's because right, yeah. it's kind of like key to like the way I think about things now. I've learned my lesson after getting a couple black eyes and <laughs> teeth knocked in. I mean, literally, I think they probably would have knocked my teeth in if I would have kept going. Um, I went back and thought about it. I'm like, okay, how can we actually provide benefit to the um, folks that play Warhammer? I'm like. Well, I noticed that they take little pieces of cotton. There was like a tank game they were playing or like a World War II sim going in the same room. Like, oh, they take a little piece of cotton and they dye it red and they stick it on the you know, quarter panel of the tank and that indicates there's damage or it's catching fire. I'm like, oh, well, I could just drag and drop that with our wand. I could just have like a menu that you could just like bring fire over and drag it out and smoke or um, click on the um, actual miniature and have a hit radius show up for them or a oh, line of sight wow yeah you're I right went back and i talked to folks and they're like no that would be cool and then i then i expanded on it like well you know it's difficult getting all your friends together to play i mean it's a serious commitment but what if you could do you know it might be toned down a little bit but um kind of a light version of uh, warhammer where you virtualize some of your like tanks and miniatures and stuff so when you when you take your dragon and you put it down on your side you see the physical dragon but across the internet because you've linked your game boards together you see a holographic version on the remote game board right so now you can actually play when you're apart and our headset has speakers and microphone built in so you can do you know team speak and all these different chat clients and um we did a bunch of experiments around this and uh People found that it actually feels like you're having the shared communal experience, like you're almost in the same room together when you um, see objects moving around the table or being moved by other, by people, other people at distance. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And we can track your hands too. So there's a lot of really cool things you can do with hand tracking. Like my, my uh, kind of favorite like 
kind of scenario, I, and this brings us to the fog of war stuff. Um, so imagine you're the DM, right? And you've planned out this adventure and you've made this virtual map with all of your uh, traps and your monsters and your dungeons and stuff in it. And your friends are sitting around the table with you. Some of them are connected to your game board remotely as well. And so you can do these theatrics, which um, wouldn't be possible before. So you could do things like with hand tracking, you'd be like an eerie mist settles into the village. And as you wave your hand across the game board, an eerie mist is actually coming out of your hand. And your people, your friends that are logged in remotely are seeing like this virtual representation of your hand and the eerie fog is settling into the village. And like, wow, that theatrics is going to be great. And uh, then the fog of war, since they can't see um, what's coming up, but you can, you can have these dramatic reveals. You can be something like the villagers told you not to enter the cave, but you did enter anyway. And then you, you know, click something on your wand and the monster springs up, you know. Wow. Yeah. And so uh, one of our partners, we're working with Fantasy Grounds. Um, so they're one of the big online uh, um, RPG platforms. So they're super excited about what they're what we're doing and they're going to support our system. So those kinds of um, capabilities over time are going to be unlocked through their platform and probably other platforms as well. Now, do you see... Um... Do you see traditional board games? Like I'm looking behind you, for example, you have Betrayal Legacy behind you. Do you see this platform being able to just take a board game like that and say, I want to play that game <clears throat> on Tilt 5? Can you, do, do, is that where you want it to go? Oh, absolutely. And I think that opens up a lot of possibilities. So whether you're actually using the physical tokens and pieces or, or it's completely virtual, I think that opens up a lot of it takes the barrier down of actually playing. So um, if you're having a long session, right, you can just save your game and come back to it later. Yeah. And then like, if you're using the physical pieces, the computer can just tell you where to put your physical right. pieces. So set it will just be like instantly. You exactly. can save and come in and out. Or if you want to play a game of Catan or something like that, it's kind of a bit more casual. You could go to a public lobby somewhere and just find a stranger to play with. Like, hey, let's uh, find three or four people you know, to play, you know, an hour game of Catan. And you could just do that. And there's a bunch of platforms out there. Uh, we're going to be making some announcements around it, but there's platforms that just have hundreds and thousands of tabletop games um, that you can just purchase for next to nothing and That's awesome. and be able to play. And I, I think it's going to be exciting for the board game manufacturers as well, because yeah. I spent a lot of time, I go on the Jonathan Colton cruise uh, which is super nerdy. If you've ever, uh, if, if you guys don't know about it, check it out. It's awesome. Um, but uh, a lot of board game designers go there and they do a lot of um, talks. And so I went up and talked to them. Like, what do you, what do you guys think about virtual um, board games? And like, overwhelmingly, they say like, we love it. Like, oh yeah, we don't see any competition. Like, if someone makes a virtual version, we. Uh, we just see upticks in the actual physical items because there's, I, I'm the same way. I'm a collector. So like, even if I get a digital version of something, like if there's a physical version of it, I'm going to get it anyway. So it makes total sense that the more people we get playing um, more virtualized versions of games, the more physical versions we'll be able to, uh, they'll see. Yeah. So, I, I love the idea. Plus they monetize it in our system too and make yeah. money on our system. I love the idea that you can take the actual pieces from the physical game, though, and still put it in the virtual world. Like, those pieces can still represent pieces on your game board. So you're, the world may be so virtual, sure. but you can still have the physical pieces. Yeah, so in the headset, um, for the, the folks that want more technical details, we have two cameras in here. So these two cameras, one of them is just tracking the wand and your head position. So where are you around the the table and what's your position and that goes down to the the game and then we have another camera it's super high resolution we have all these tricks around infrared illumination where we can strobe infrared illumination we can pick up things like um, playing cards um, there's various ways that we can detect those we can detect complicated objects like uh, miniatures or simple objects like little meeples and um, get those into your virtual space and there's just like a thousand different ways that you can interface to um, and detect these these real pieces. So the game, the game, uh, the Tilt Five hardware consists of 
uh, the headset or the glasses, a wand, yep. and a game board. How big is the game board itself or the table, whatever you want to call it? Do you call it a Our game board? A game board, yeah. which is which is interesting because, you know, it's not only a game system. Like, we have all these people approaching us to do, you know, productivity apps. And the virtual <laughs> it's always board. like... <laughs> yeah we struggle with that internally we always call it the game board but then the people that want to do productivity stuff with it are like rail at that game board it's right like, right you're not doing a game um so the game board the base one is um i'm going to get this wrong but it's going to be just about right it's like um three quarters of a meter square ish let okay. me get it's uh yeah i'm just reading so, it here 31.5 by 31.5 by 42 yeah, the, okay, yeah, the or rectangle. the large. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's a good and, size. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we we did a lot of uh, jumping into people's homes and like, hey, can we set up our game board? Can we actually try this in your home? And so we we shrunk and grow, grew the board over the last few years to find like the right sizes for um, various configurations. So like the rectangle or the square board is really nice for coffee tables and you still have room yeah. on your coffee table to have your your beer pizza and chips <laughs> which i kind of just geeked out a little bit thinking about uh fantasy flights uh star wars x-wing game oh my gosh that would be amazing at ar oh, that would that would <laughs> yeah so well yeah that would work really <laughs> well if, if you guys work there we want to talk to you <laughs> i wish i worked there but uh, yeah, <laughs> Fantasy Flight games, there's so many of their games would work so well in AR. You yeah. should you should reach out to them for sure. <laughs> that would be awesome. We're, we're, in a, we're in an interesting situation right now. So we're a really tiny company. So uh, we're actually drowning in opportunity. It's, uh, it's hard for us to keep up. Um, but we're doing a Kickstarter now and it's going really, really well. So that means that uh, new opportunities to bring personnel on board is going to, you know, be there for us. So we'll be get we'll get better at being able to work with more and more developers. Awesome. But yeah, there's there's uh, over a dozen developers working with our old developer kits, and uh, we're just refreshing all of their developer kits to the new snazzy uh, um, glasses. It's I'm super proud. I mean, so. Um, I don't know if it's going to make it into this cut of the video, but Cast AR, um, we did a lot of work. But pretty much this entire design has happened in the last couple of years. So all of this new reprojection technology that lets us plug into phones and plug into um, computers happened this year. All the, the the production tooling. So we're we're working through um, you know just the last of our manufacturing issues. Like right now, I've been going back and forth with the factory. Like this hinge is supposed to latch and it's supposed to be flat across here but we missed misaligned a hole on the pin that goes through there and we're like super close to getting this out that's really cool it looks great too it does yeah so yeah, I, it's funny i love uh I, i've been uh, doing youtube and been a, a, a presence on the internet for quite some time i just love when the trolls come out it's so fun <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, you know it's uh we uh, we put a lot of thought. We did a lot of, um, of st studies. And we we talked to a lot of people, and the color and the shape of the first version of this was very intentional. And the trolls love to make fun of it, but it, it doesn't bother me one bit. I don't care. I don't yeah, care that looks this looks great. like a barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> the, Whatever. The, the trolls came out and they're. Like, that looks like a stupid barbecue lighter. You're stupid, stupid, stupid. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, so we went over and uh, I made a barbecue lighter demo in Unity and I just posted a GIF online. Like, yeah, here, click and a little flame and I nice. set stuff on. Like, Screw you guys. Nice. So it's on Kickstarter now. Yeah. Um, and uh, when, when are you hoping to have the product ready for Kickstarter supporters? Uh, so we have some super early kits, and so do not back us if you are not ready for bugs. So we have the super early developers, people that like to hunt down bugs, and that one's fifteen hundred dollars. Um, you get the production glasses afterwards as well, so you get both. Okay. The, uh, the bug ridden ones, and those are going to be Q1 of next year, pretty early, and then Q2 are going to be the production ones. And we've sold so many so far, it's going gangbusters on Kickstarter right now that we've 
sold our first uh, batch that are going to go out in June, and now we've opened up the batch that are going to go out in July, and I suspect by the end of the month, the July um, shipments are going to be full. We're going to get into August at least. Um, so if you're interested in getting it like first thing, you probably want to get in there right away, or you might have to wait until August to get one of them. Um, we're doing that, you know, I've been in manufacturing for quite a while, and I, I know the limits of what we can do. And it's going to be a lot of work for us to get these things out worldwide. We're, uh, we're trying to make it super friendly for people that are overseas. So we've been working with a logistics company to do direct injection into Europe so that we can bypass some of the extra fees and you know, doing the same thing into um, other markets. And But, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be tricky even though it's going to be like a thousand units in right. June or whatever it is, it's it, it's going to take a lot of work just to get those first th thousand out. Now, if somebody misses the Kickstarter, because usually Kickstarters are thirty days or so, can, will they be able to pre-order on your Tilt Five website? Eventually, yeah, okay. yeah, we're going to continue selling um, by some <laughs> to be determined means, but we're not going to. Um, deliver any of those unless they're until the kickstarters are fulfilled so right. those will be after august probably sure awesome well that is awesome is there anything else you want to say before we uh we say good night oh my god i can go <laughs> on and on. i can go on sure. and on about there's just so many things around tabletop games and social video games that the system can do it's hard to just get it all out in yeah. in a short little interview it's well, i love i love you, what you're doing it's it's absolutely amazing virtual tabletop that you can you can play a tabletop game with someone who's not even in the room with you and i think that is amazing because tico and i talk about this all the time like we're both yeah. in different cities but we we're always trying to play games together and it's it's hard to organize if we were to able we were able to do that virtually with something like tilt five that would be amazing because then we could play anywhere. I could just set up on my table. He sets like up on his. We're playing tomorrow. We don't have to worry about travel, about right. the weather or anything. Yeah. 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 That's uh, what's that's, amazing. I mean, linking game boards together, that, that I'm just most excited about that. And the second thing I'm most excited about is bringing people around the table and like having that heightened experience, like the things I was talking about at Valve. It's like, you know, there's nothing like being around the table with your friends. And if we can, if we can at least get you 80% of that feeling when you're right. playing remote, like it's going to be magical. Well, I must say there's, there's nothing like playing a game with your friends around a table. There's also nothing like playing a virtual game in 3d yeah. on a table. <laughs> so. I know it's, it's jaw dropping every, I mean, I still, I mean, we went to Penny Arcade, Gen Con, XOXO, a bunch of different events, and like I just can't get over hearing people. So the first thing they say is like when they do this, they're like, "Oh wow!" Like every single time. And then when they uh, recognize that they can still see their hands, mm -hmm. they can see their friends and their phone, and they can drink their beer, and <laughs> like, <laughs> they're just like, "I'm so the important <laughs> things." The important things, the That's beer. Right. Well, Jerry, thank you so much for coming on and telling us about Tilt 5. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Um, good thank luck you. with everything. Uh, Thanks I for helping us get the word out. Of course. Absolutely. Of course. I am I am excited for this product. It's amazing. Thank you so much yeah. for coming on the show. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.